I was born and raised in Shemokin, Pennsylvania. I was born and raised in Mount Carmel. I was born and raised in Locust Gap, Pennsylvania. Hi everyone, this is the Morning Mayor Tom Kutzer. Hey, this weekend's weather is just perfect for the Soupy Bakers listening in. Temperatures, by the way, will be in the 40s all weekend long. Man, that's great weather for... How's it hanging? This is Pennsylvania's coal region, located in the central Appalachian Mountain, covering such counties as Lackawanna, Luzerne, Columbia, Carbon, Schuylkill, and Northumberland. Its heritage is rich in Irish, Polish, and Eastern European backgrounds. It once thrived on the industry of anthracite coal mining, one of Pennsylvania's oldest and first major industries. And while the coal industry has long left, its roots to its culture is still present today. Just drive into one of these towns and take a look around. You'll get a sense of what once was a thriving, booming town. But you will also get a look into the textbook Americana that many urbanites are unfamiliar with. There's a lot of community pride in the coal region that isn't in other places, and it's one of a kind. We have wonderful old Victorian towns that are rich, rich in architectural heritage. Um, a lot of influence from, um, you know, the, the East Lake period and later Victorian era. I like the, the hometown feel. Everybody looks out for each other and uh, everybody's friendly and will speak to you. My great grandmother bought this house in 1897 and our family's lived in this house for 117 years. So we've been right here all the time. Even if you don't know the people, you can talk to them for the longest time, just like they're one of your best friends. People are close, and that's what makes it nice. From its now stripped coal mines, one will also find many attractions for all walks of life. Knobles Amusement Resort, one of America's most unique parks. Knobles attract approximately 1.3 million people every year. When you go to Knobles, you'll see exactly why. Yingling Brewery in Pottsville. This is America's oldest brewery. And that is no advertising gimmick. They do have free tours, by the way, with free samples. Try their Yingling Lager. The coal region is also host to some unique sites, like the Centralia Mine Fire, an underground fire that has been burning for half a century under the borough of Centralia, just outside Mount Carmel. Another element that makes this area so unique is the multi-ethnic heritage of food and recipes. Everyone in the coal region knows foods like boilo, pierogies, halushki, potato kicks, halupki. But there is one food that stands out among all of them. There is one food so unique to the coal region of Pennsylvania that those who are familiar with it would often go through great lengths and travel many miles to obtain a taste. And that is the coveted soup. Pennsylvania is home to several strange meats such as bologna, kielbasa, and scrapple. But what about soupy? 
What is a soupy? A soupy is a pork product. Some people use pork butts, some use fresh hams, and some use the loins. It's an Italian sausage, supersada, but it's a cured, made with fresh porks, put in a casing, and it's cured and pressed for a couple of months until you can slice it, and that's what we sell here. We make a, a sandwich with the soupy. It's an Italian delicacy that really got popular around here. For some reason, they start making them, you know, when I was a kid. So we've been making them for about 25 years, um, but even at that time, it, was, it certainly wasn't new to the area. If you travel outside the coal region of Pennsylvania, but stay within the state, let's say Philadelphia, well, let's take to the streets of Philly and ask the people of Philadelphia, what is a soupy? I would assume it's a sort of food, I guess. Something has to do with soup. I don't know, I've never heard of a soupy before. A soupy or a selfie? Soupy, I have no idea. A soupy sales? The soupy? How do you spell that? Uh, a very liquid form of soup. I would guess it's some type of Chinese dish or something. I don't know. I don't know, Snoopy's cousin? I want to say a soupy could possibly be a mess of soup. <laughs> we were able to locate one at the Bruno Brothers House of Cheese. This one looks much different from the coal region soupy. Try doing an image search for most images will get our ones that look like this. We now go inside the famous De Bruno Brothers in Philadelphia, located in the heart of the Italian market area, to discuss what they know about the soupy. My name is Emilio Magnucci. I'm third generation. I was fortunate enough to be born into the family, and uh, I guess ultimately my job is to eat really good and drink even better. My grandparents came over from Italy, saved enough money to open a store in 1939. They called it the Bruno Brothers. And my grandfather, Danny, realized that they had to do something different. They had to specialize in something. So he got rid of all that everyday stuff and he decided to focus on cheese. That's when they changed the name of the store to the Bruno Brothers, the House of Cheese. I didn't know what a soupy was until back in the early 90s when people from the coal region would come down here or even the Poconos area would come down and say, oh, you got soupies. And I was like, soupies? What, what the heck's a soupy? And, and, you know, in our minds here, it's, it's Soprasat. So when I found out, it, you know, they were calling it soupies up there and that's what it was, then I knew, okay, you know, this is, you know, this is, yes, we sell soupies. The soupies that uh, my grandparents used to make were, um, you know, a hot and a mild, and they did a, a round and a flat style. Soupies or soprasadas fall into the salami family. Uh, ultimately, that family of cured meats, whether it's whole muscle meats like prosciutto or speck, or some type of finocchione salami, or some soprasada or soupy salami, um, fall into a category called salumi. Salumi is plural for all of that, and that's, the, that's where the word salami is derived from. Generally, it's a southern Italian product, you know, in and around Calabria, um, Abruzzo, uh, even down in Sicily, uh, they'll make it. When you go f up in the northern regions of Italy, uh, most of the time they're using whole muscle meats and curing those. In our business and what we do, I love to make people happy, you know, by, by letting them try great foods. Supersides are one of a really important traditional food item that, that, that has a story to tell in, in our heritage. It's important to understand where it comes from and why. Supersad, like prosciutto, is a real treat. It's a real special item. Uh, and you can learn a lot from, you know, just asking a couple questions about it. Every year, some soupy makers take their craft to the competitive level at an event called the Soupy Bowl, where soupies are tasted by a panel of judges and awards are given to the top three contenders. Awards that are in the shape of a pig. At the time, that was like the grand champion of them all was the Forest Hill Soupy Bowl. They built it as the Soupy Bowl, and that's the one that everybody wanted. 
The cool part about that too is before they would bring the, the finalists back, they would have a couple contests of like, they would have a, a string, a, a, a stuffer and a casing and you would have to stuff five soupies as quick as you could, you and a partner. I, I did try that one time and my partner choked. Looking at you, Forrest Kern. <laughs> How did this Italian meat make its way to a predominantly Irish, Polish, Eastern European region? Uh, soupies came to the coal region when um, Italian immigrants came over to the states. Uh, a, a large population uh, settled in Coltmont, Pennsylvania, and they were primarily uh, Calabria, uh, Cal Calabres. They needed cheap labor, and the coal region was just a, an enormous melting pot for Polish, uh, Italians, Irish, German, you know, you name it. It just happened to be a time where they all came over and that they brought their traditions with them. It's less industrial, they're more farmers. They use up every part of the, the pig and they'll grind it into a salami or a soupy. So as farmers, you had to prepare for the long winters. So when they made the, the sobersides and they cured them and um, they, they would have the, this meat product that they, they didn't waste, when they would butcher their pig and they would make their sausages and stuff, like say this for example, the supersada, they would allow that to hang from start until the end of the season. They didn't put theirs in oil until the end of the season. So that meat would hang down there. They would eat it off the line. After the curing process was over, they would eat it right off the, right off the line. Not until the end of the season, which is more towards April when it started to warm up, if they had anything left over, that's when they would preserve it in the oil. All of Calabria made the cured meats, everybody raised the pig. When it was time to butcher it, they cured everything, whatever they needed, and, and that was what they lived off of. My uh, family came from a, a town called Isca, which is uh, also uh, in Calabria, and uh, that's where I learned the recipe. My, my great-grandparents came from Isca. They lived in Atlas, so they brought it, I mean, where he lived. Coltman has an enormous population of uh, descendants from Isca. Probably per capita, Coleman probably makes quite a bit of soupy, I would think. Talk to anyone in the region today, and they'll say that soupies have always been around. But how is it made? What are the steps involved in making soupies? It's just, you take your pork, you grind it up, okay? You add your seasoning, you let it hang, so it cures, you press it, you let it hang it again, okay? So then it, that, that's about a six week process and then you put it in oil and some people keep them for up to 10, 12, even 15 years. We basically like to use them all up every year. We kind of grew away from doing the hand mixing and now we get it pre-mixed when we, when we purchase our meat. Everybody kind of makes them their own way. A lot of people now, just to save on time, they get their meat ground. Um, However, I, I like to do it the way my grandfather always did. I like, I'm big on tradition. I like to make my, the, the soupies. I, I get the fresh hams. I trim them, you know, trim the fat off them, debone them, cut them up, grind it. We, we season it. Our recipe came over from Italy. That's what I use to this day. Um, and uh, I will continue to use that. It's a good question that, uh, um, that people ask about why some are pressed and some are left around. What's the reason? The only thing that I can think of in my years of traveling, because nobody really has a great answer. They, you know, I know that it's very, it's very much a Calabrese style to be um, pressing them. The only soupy that I know are, are the pressed ones. I mean, that's where, that's the way they did it when they brought it over, you know, they press them. And... The way we make them, we press them because it helps to get the moisture out and it helps the drying process. Um, I have made some already that, that have been round. Uh, it just takes a little bit longer to, to, to cure. The round ones, from what I understand, they would have to hang a whole lot longer and then you have more of a room, more room where they may spoil, that sort of thing. Soupy, supersadas, they need a, a um, cool air to, to cure them. The temp obviously, if any kind of meat, I mean, you're dealing with raw, raw meat that is salt and air cured. And if you have 
uh, warmer temperatures, meat, they, they won't, it won't be able to cure. The woman that taught me how to make them, she always said 40 degrees. So that's kind of where we kept it. It could get a little warmer, you know, the airflow. I, I honestly think the airflow is more important to a, to a point than the temperature. I mean, you don't want it 90 degrees, obviously. You can't make them in, in July. But the air, as long as you got the air flowing and if they don't get too cold, and you know, you, you should be pretty good. You want to keep the temperature low enough that they don't spoil, but the temperature can't go low enough that they're freezing. So uh, it's a, you're on that fine line between being too cold or too hot. So you got to keep them at that right temperature. And this time of year, it's easier to bring the temperature up a little bit than to get it cold. Our first house had an attic. And it was fantastic. I mean, when, because you got to kind of keep the temperature, you know, right around where you need it. And the attic was nice because you just opened a door and the cold air didn't come down, but the hot air went up and you could regulate it and it was, you know, no problem at all. But when we built this house, that was one of the first things on our mind. We told the builder, we have to figure out something where I could hang soupy. And, and he had, he was from across the river and he had no idea what they were or anything like that. He finally said, well, why don't we put uh, vent blocks actually in both ends underneath our front porch? When we're done making them, we split them up, usually wipe them down with um, lemon juice first, and then we'll store them in olive oil. So the whole thing of the oil is to just to keep anything from further to decompose the meat to keep away the oxygen and everything else. It's like, it's the way to preserve it that's been, I guess, traditional for years. The problem with storing your soupies in the oil all the time is that if it gets too warm, where you have them stored and that oil goes rancid, you're gonna lose a lot of really hard work and really great, you know, meat that you've spent time and energy and money on. There's now a new way that people are actually using the, the vacuum sealers. I myself was a little bit skeptical of this However, I, I've experimented with, uh, with vacuum sealing the entire soupy, which has actually held off and worked. When you're spending all that time, effort, and money f to create something, you don't want it just to get old and dry and not uh, be around. So when you, when you cryovac it, when you shrink wrap that, y you're suspending its aging process. I think that's a, a very smart idea. I personally will, will taste them off the line. I think it's a really good cured meat. Uh, it's a fresher flavor uh, and the oil, you know, it changes. The taste changes in the oil. Our film crew was invited to spend the weekend in a cabin with a crew of coal region guys to witness their weekend tradition of soupy making. We've always talked about getting a cabin together. So uh, at one point we started looking for a cabin. I ended up buying this cabin with basically the sole purpose of doing things just like this. Once I got the cabin, this was like, okay, we're gonna make soupies and we're gonna do it here. This is the, the, the first time that we, you know, that we made soupies, we made them here. So it's kind of become a cool tradition for us to come up for the weekend and make our soupies here. It's just fun when, you know, guys, a bunch of buddies come together and in the middle of the winter and hang out and to have fun and make soupy. We enjoy coming up here. We make good food when we come up here. We, you know, we, we just have a good time when we come up here. So uh, it, I look forward to this every year. There's seven of us this year. We had seven last year. There's one guy who was in and couldn't make it this year, and we got a new guy this year, so mostly the same people. And that's part of it, you know. You want to be the group, you know. You have to know people to get into a group. You know, it's, it's like a little exclusive club, and some, some clubs are not willing to take on new people. What I think is the neatest part of it that uh, these younger guys are all into making that and carrying it traditionally. And it's such a regional thing. Well, talk about it, I mean, you made soupies. Everybody in the made it individually. You made yeah. soupies in a group. Yeah. 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 I made soupies in a group. I mean, with every person. We all came the, from different All groups. of us making soupies together for three years. Three years. Yeah, yeah, everybody has their own <laughs> recipe. Because you don't want to make something that everybody has. It's a weekend away with buddies and friends is, is more of it than to make them in the actual soupy. As far as Technicality, we did turn to Hanks tonight. We put them in lemon juice, they're ready to go for We're still tomorrow. waiting on that card game. Probably well, 
you explain what the Hanks are? Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what we're going to be using. Not really, if you want people to eat them. It's the biggest waste of money you got out there, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. But it's all about friendship. It, it, Soapies is great, and but it's about the friends. Friends come in and drink a beer. Make soupies at home no. yeah. by themselves. Yeah. It's a weekend no, away. So and that's it's every group that. I've ever made it with it was about guys getting together, drinking beer, having fun. Right. <laughs> Make a little breakfast. Eggs, hash browns, bacon, and biscuits. Oh, sorry. Killing me. Somebody else, anybody else? Hey. I'm putting soupy meat into fall shape. It helps get the air out, so when you put them through the presses, there's not as much air gets into the soupy itself. This is the pork mixture for the regular soupy. And at the end of the table, these are pepperonis. This puts what they call the catcher. So he catches the meat as it comes out of the stuffer. And then I'm the tire tie the knots on the ends so we can uh, hang them up and they, you know, that's what makes one soupy. You gotta put a knot on, fill it, put a knot, then another knot, and then you cut it. And that's a beauty right there. I'm doing just uh, making sure there's no air in the casings because you don't want any air. To poke different holes into it and then basically tie the other side. And if there's any areas in the casing that are stretched, there's that time you'd have to put a, a patch on it. You tie it, and then you have your knot there to hang. That knot won't break. There are certain things about soupies that you can't learn from a recipe book. And while knowing the history of a generation of people is important, this tradition is deep-rooted and very personable. It's actually made in the United States of America. <laughs> Unusual. My grandfather's. When he had his... Uh, Steiner. Steiner. <laughs> we do all the, we do all the, they had his uh, meat market, it was the second time. restaurant, I guess they had a little cafe. One. Uh, soupy making runs as far back as when my grandfather uh, was, a, was a child and he learned from his grandfather. I, I have a lot of um, memories of, of stories my grandfather used to tell me. He was uh, Carl Avellino, uh, great, great man. And uh, he would tell me stories about when he first started making with his father. They didn't have all the equipment we have today to grind the meat. So what they would need to do is they would get their fresh hams and they would cut the meat and cut it into small cubes and actually hand stuff them in the casings. And, and the curing process was different too because you're talking about solid pieces of cubed meat instead of ground, ground meat. Uh, my, my grandfather on, on my father's side, he passed away 
when I was only a few months old. So I never got the experience of learning what he knew and what he went through and, and things like that. I was introduced to making soupies when I was 10 years old. And my uh, grandfather and grandmother, they made them prior to that. Yet now you have like all this big crews of people making making soupies. It was just two people. It was my grandfather and my grandmother. And my grandmother, who was four foot eleven, little Polish lady, she tied them, not using any tapes, and, and you know, on her fingers. And just that that generation was really tough. You know, they just tied them up. No complaints till later. My dad takes very good care wherever we've been making them. We had a fan going on them. He'd go out and turn the fan off. So he was constant care of the soupies. That does a lot to the end product because everybody's using the same thing. You know, they're using pork, they're using the same spices. When our first son was born, I, I really took a, a liking to learning about my family, my grandfather, his parents, my great grandparents, where they came from. And that the whole soupy thing just fell right along with that as that was one thing that that they, they did and uh, we wanted to continue it. Unfortunately, uh, when, we're, when I'm making soupies, um, the family end of it kind of dwindled when my grandfather died. So it's, a, it's definitely a passion, it's definitely a tradition that I want to make sure that my kids experience and I know my, my two-year-old, he eats soupies like there's no tomorrow. When he was only one years old, he was having a little bit of a tantrum. I took him down to the soupy room because I had to get the soupies off the press. And he actually helped me with 157 soupies, he took every single one and handed it to me. And then halfway through, he tasted one by putting his tongue on it, and then he handed it to me. So uh, I gave that one to my friends. It's just something I've always done with my dad. Um, and I think it'd be cool to do it with both of my boys. And one day they'll be sitting here with some other guy and talking about it. <laughs> If you have your ingredients right, that's the easy part of it. He always told me, make sure you pay attention when, when they're hanging and the drying part of it. I remember times where he said, you got to get over here right away. We got to get these off the press. He would use vinegar water, wipe them off, rehang them, then repress them down the road. The only way now you learn that is, is, is through doing, doing the process and you learn as you go and then sometimes these memories come back to you. It stands as a reminder what my grandfather did and his father did and what they went through when they came over here um, to make to make my life the way it is right now we that's why we continue to do it in the soupy hanging room i uh, you'll notice i keep my grandfather's cane there uh, because he's not around to uh, look after him now i figured his cane will will do the trick to keep him safe down there and so we don't have any problems with him So while soupies themselves and the soupy making process are an important part of the coal region culture, it's about more than just the meat itself. I don't think enough people know about Sobersad or understand what Sobersad is or really get Sobersad. Um, I love, I love to get it in people's mouths and give them a taste. And, and you know, you know those people that have no idea and when you see their eyes light up and they're like, oh, you know, and, and they get it by the taste. It bonds us, be it family or friends. It unites us as a group of people from all walks of life. It defines us as a region of hard-working individuals who carry on their traditions. And it reminds us of our past while keeping us watchful on our future. So go ahead and take a bite of a soup, whether it's round or flat, spicy or mild, cut thin or thick, stored in oil or vacuum sealed, you'll see that there is nothing strange about this meat.
Awesome and delicious. Yeah, that's all right. All right.